Hello again, friends. We're going to talk about another imprinting disorder here called Angelman syndrome. So this is a, another pretty rare dis disorder. Uh, you don't see this one very often, uh, but uh, this is a neurobehavioral condition. And you probably associate this with one of the things that you see here. And that is that these children tend to be very, very happy in appearance. Uh, and so uh, that is something that you should remember about Angelman syndrome because I would bet that the USMLE will give you that. And that is a very, very characteristic feature of Angelman syndrome. And it's not something that you see in a lot of other uh, disorders. There's a few others, but they're extremely rare. Uh, so, but really, Angelman syndrome is a lot more than just those laughing spells and the smiling and happy demeanor. Uh, you have a, a relatively severe uh, cognitive deficit. Uh, you also have movement disorder, tremor, ataxia, and uh, in in consort with their with their cognitive issues, they tend to not develop uh, any speech at all. Uh, so this is productive speech. They do have a, a uh, their receptive language ability is a little bit better than their uh, than their um, productive language ability. Archaically, this is called the happy puppet syndrome. If you look at a lot of the, uh, we've known about this disorder for a while, uh, but it really wasn't uh, uh, well characterized until Dr. Angelman came across it and uh, henceforth named it after himself. Um, but uh, prior to the 1960s, 1970s, you may hear this, uh, or even around that period of time, uh, you may hear this referred to as the happy puppet syndrome. This is due to a mutation or a deletion of UB3A, uh, which codes for a ubiquitin uh, protein enzyme. And uh, it's got to be on the chromosome that's inherited from the mother because the mother's UB3A is the only UB3A that's going to be expressed by the child. So you get two copies. You get one from mom, you get one from dad, but the one you get from dad is turned off and you only express the one from mom. So if the one you get from mom has a deletion or a mutation, then you'll have Angelman syndrome. You can also get it from paternal uniparental disomy, and that would be, in that case, the same thing, essentially, because you have two paternal copies, and so both are going to be silenced. Uh, the incidence is about 1 in 12,000 to 1 in 20,000, so this is a little bit more common than prader willi syndrome, uh, but it's still on the rarer end of things. So again, this is that happy puppet syndrome, and this uh, is the painting that Dr. Angelman came across and said that, oh, this person looks like some of my patients that I have, and he uh, characterized this uh, syndrome. And actually, this painting does have a lot of the facial features that you see in Angelman syndrome. So this is the uh, little cartoon that I uh, talked about in uh, my section uh, that I did on imprinting and UPD. So if you want to uh, look at that, uh, feel free to go back there. Uh, but I'm not going to explain this, in the genetics of this uh, in too great of detail on here. The cause of Angelman syndrome is, like mentioned, either a deletion or a mutation on the maternal gene of UB3A. That's going to account for about 80% of Angelman syndrome cases. Paternal U, uh, UPD accounts for another 5%, and then the remaining cases are due to either translocations, mutations to surrounding genes, or unknown causes. And the vast majority of these are sporadic. So even though there may be a deletion or a mutation on the maternal gene, it doesn't mean that the mother herself has it. And that has implications because a parent may ask, well, what's, what are the chances that I might have another child that has Angelman syndrome? And the likelihood is still quite low. It's not a 50-50 chance likely. But we still do counseling, genetic counseling, for any patient that gives birth to a child with prader willi or Angelman syndrome on both parents, um, we want to know because we want to know if they carry, uh, if, if they're a carrier. And a lot of times they'll know that because there'll be a family history of similar uh, syndromes. They may even know about it. So the features that you see, of course, are the severe developmental delay, speech impairment, uh, which 
virtually uh, no speech. The laughing paroxysms and happy demeanor, they're also, they tend to be excitable and that can cause some behavioral problems where uh, they, they may uh, have difficulty sleeping. Uh, they'll have a reduced attention span. Uh, their facial features, uh, they start out, their head starts out normal, but it grows a lot slower, and so by age two, they have a microcephaly. They also have a very prominent chin, especially if you look from the side, but even if you look at the front, you can kind of see this prominent chin. Uh, the protruding tongue isn't as, uh, isn't, doesn't feature as much, but the, this, this here, this wide mouth and widely spaced teeth, from the pictures that I've seen, are, are almost universal. Uh, neurologically, of course, there's the movement disorder, which is going to impact their ability to walk. Uh, they uh, have a predilection towards seizures. Uh, they can have this thing called non-convulsive status epilepticus. And then they have characteristic EEG features. You don't need to worry about NCSE or uh, reading EEGs for these patients. But you should know that with Angelman syndrome, they have a tendency towards seizures, about 80%. And then they also have increased deep tendon reflexes. Other things that you'll see are abnormal sleep patterns. That's a common struggle for uh, Angelman's patients, particularly their parents. Uh, strabismus, sensitivity to heat. They do have an increased appetite, similar to prader Willi patients, but it's not to the same extreme, and these patients don't go to obesity like prader Willi patients do. Uh, they can also have pica, uh, poor suck and swallow uh, reflex. When, they're, when they walk, they tend to have uplifted, flexed arms. I'll show you a picture of that, what their gait kind of looks like. They can also have constipation uh, and then hydrophilia. That's kind of a unique feature with Angelman syndrome, but they have this great love for the water. So this is what I meant with the arms held up and flexed. Um, this is how they tend to walk. So you can see that these kids' uh, teeth are very widely spaced out. Look at these uh, the lower incisors here. There's space in between each of the teeth. Um, oh, there's another thing to say. you can see here. Um, not a lot. It's the, mostly, the, mostly the teeth that, uh, that you notice on this kid. The chin, it's, it'd be, it'll maybe, it doesn't look too prominent, but maybe if you look from the side, it's hard to tell. So again here, uh, you see uh, the, the more widely spaced out teeth. His jaw looks like it's coming at you a little bit. Uh, so notice the shape. I guess, the, I guess his jaw is sort of shaped similarly too. Notice the shape of the jaw. This sort of triangular jaw shape is, uh, is something that these patients will tend to have. Again, see these widely spaced out teeth here. You see it in this patient too. Uh, so as they get older, their face tends to get longer. Uh, the, the jaw will become even more prominent. And then here's an adult with Angelman syndrome. Right, so uh, development. Uh, their physical development is uh, primarily going to be hindered by their ataxia and movement disorder. Uh, cognitively, and you can call these patients, a lot of uh, advocate groups call these Angelman syndrome patients, they call them angels. That's kind of a sweet name for them. Uh, and it also kind of reflects their, their happy demeanor. So I, I like that name, so I'll, I, I will call them angels. Uh, for, for shorthand term, most people don't consider that to be offensive at all because everybody likes to think of their kids as little angels. Um, but all angels will have uh, severe cognitive deficits, mental retardation. I think the, the new word for that is, uh, what do they call that now? Um, intellectual disability. I, know, I still use mental retardation. Expressive language skills are severely impacted, but their receptive language skills might be a little bit stronger. As these kids grow up, some of them uh, can adapt by using signs. That doesn't mean they're going to be fluent in American Sign Language, but they can use signs to 
express themselves. Socially, they tend to have very good social skills and fit in in their peer groups, but uh, during childhood, uh, hyperactivity can be problematic, especially if they're in a school setting. And then the sleep disturbances certainly uh, are going to be problematic if they're there. Uh, the reason is because these kids, it seems uh, that they don't need as much sleep. Um, they have very, uh, very hard time regulating their, their, uh, their sleep rhythms. As they get older, uh, their concentration and attention span tend to improve, and their hyperactivity will improve with that. Their self-help skills vary. It really just depends on uh, how severe the mental retardation is. Uh, universally, they're not able to live independently, uh, but many will be able to learn how to feed themselves with utensils, and uh, most of them will become toilet trained and dress themselves uh, with assistance. But universally, these, uh, these children, when they grow up and get into adulthood, they're either going to have to live with family or they're going to have to live in, a, uh, in an assisted living uh, home or a group home. For diagnosis, uh, the best initial diagnostic test is going to be a methylation analysis uh, and fluorescent situ hybridization. Uh, the this initial methylation analysis actually will, uh, will give you a, uh, a positive result 70 per, in 70 percent of cases. Um, so you start out with that, um, but if it's normal, uh, then you can directly test for the UV3A mutation. So this is an example of a uh, methylation test. Uh, so this is for Prader-Willi syndrome and for Angelman syndrome. So you're testing for the maternal uh, input and the paternal input. For Angelman syndrome, you're going to be missing your maternal input. Differential diagnosis for Angelman syndrome. Uh, these bottom two, don't worry about. I, I've never seen them come up on the USMLE, but I really wanted to include them because they're so similar, have some a lot of very, very similar features. Uh, almost deceptively similar to Angelman syndrome, but they're very rare. Only about 600 cases between the two of these have ever been described. But I do want to uh, highlight the differences between Angelman syndrome and Rett syndrome because Rett syndrome has a tendency to come up on the test. So this is, Rett syndrome is a psychiatric diagnosis. First of all, it almost exclusively happens in girls. Uh, these patients, though, they tend to develop normally until around one or two years of age, whereas in Angelman syndrome, they look abnormal from the get-go. So not only do they have the abnormal facial features, but they really never attain those gross motor milestones, or at least it takes them much longer than a year or two to, uh, to really attain them normally. Whereas with Rett syndrome, they develop completely normally until about one to two years of age, and then they start to regress and deteriorate. And some of the common findings that you can run into uh, include chorea, and the way the, the stereotypic uh, chorea that's associated with Rett syndrome is hand wringing. Uh, but you can see hand wringing in Angelman syndrome, so that's why it's part of the differential. Other things you can see are dystonia, behavioral features sim similar to autism, and this is an area where you kind of can differentiate this off from Angelman syndrome. So these behavioral features that you see with Rett syndrome include screaming fits, inconsolable crying, lack of emotional reciprocity, avoidance of eye contact, impaired social interaction. That's not something you see in Angelman syndrome. Angelman syndrome kids tend to be really social. They tend to be delightful, whereas Rett syndrome patients tend to be more like autism, where they're more, they're, they're more reclusive. Uh, not saying that you know autistic or Rett patients are not charming, but uh, but they tend to be a little bit more to themselves and reclusive, play alone. Whereas Angelman syndrome patients, as affected as they are, they like to be around people and interacting with people. That tends to be what they they like to do. So hopefully you kind of differentiate these two now. So the management, there's no cure, obviously, uh, but uh, we're going to focus on reducing symptoms, preventing complications, and then, of course, optimizing their functioning. So the one big thing uh, medically that we have to worry about is seizures. 
So the standard regimen that's used is valproate and benzodiazepines. Uh, other drugs can be used, some of the newer drugs, uh, particularly Keppra with levetiracetam is, uh, has been used successfully. You can also use Lomictil or Topamax. Um, one thing you should do is avoid carbamazepine. This, is a, uh, this, this can actually worsen the seizures. And another thing that's recommended is a ketogenic diet. This can be beneficial in preventing seizure activity. Hyperactivity and impulse behavior, the first line of therapy for this is behavioral therapy, but if this is severe and refractive, we can use low-dose uh, Risperdal or amitriptyline. The sleep disturbance typically is managed by uh, making good sleep hygiene, reducing the amount of light in the bedroom, especially with blue light that might come from clocks or TVs. TVs are really a no-no for any uh, kid's bedroom. Um, but another way you can, uh, you can help this, you can use therapeutic melatonin. It's important, gosh, I think five hours is what I came, came up with off the top of my head, but you have, to, you have to make sure that patients are aware that you don't take melatonin like a sleeping pill. You don't take it like an hour before bed. It takes some time for it to absorb up into your system. So you have to take it several hours before bed, uh, but it is effective in about 50% of patients. And as you can probably imagine, this is going to be a multidisciplinary management, developmental pediatrics, uh, to uh, make sure that these children are developing as optimally as they can, neurology to manage the seizures, physical and occupational therapy to maximize their functioning uh, and their strength, speech therapy, dietitian, genetic counseling, they're all going to be involved. So while independent living is not possible for these uh, patients, consistent management and effective therapy can help them uh, attain a semi-independent life in a supervised setting. Um, under proper treatment and supervision, uh, their lifespan is uh, typically normal. So if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and uh, write me below, and I will see you next time.